In November 1837, there was a riot in the city of Alton, Illinois. Two men were killed. One was a man named Bishop, about whom we know very little, and the other was Elijah Parrish Lovejoy, the editor of the newspaper, The Alton Observer. The riot and the two deaths were intimately tied to the tensions in the nation in the two decades prior to the U.S. Civil War and tested some of the most fundamental values of the still young nation. In 1857, future President Abraham Lincoln wrote, Lovejoy's tragic death for freedom in every sense marks his sad ending as the most important single event to ever happen in the new world. It is history that deserves to be remembered. Elijah Lovejoy was born November 9, 1802 in Albion, Maine. The son of a congregational minister, he excelled in school, getting a degree with honors from Waterville College, now called Colby College, in Maine. He eventually went west and by 1827 was teaching in the growing western city of St. Louis, Missouri. In 1830, he became part owner and editor of a newspaper called the St. Louis Times, a secular newspaper that supported Henry Clay, who was then Secretary of State for President. The United States was in the midst of a Protestant religious revival that historians call the Second Great Awakening. The movement drove reforms intended to remedy the evils of society before the anticipated second coming of Christ, and thus one of the underlying drivers of the movement was opposition to slavery. In 1832, Lovejoy, who despite a religious upbringing was not a religious man, or as one biographer described him was destitute of vital piety, though not a confirmed infidel, was converted and became a Presbyterian. He sold his interest in the newspaper and returned to the East, where he attended the Princeton Theological Seminary in New Jersey, and in April 1833 became an ordained minister. In November, he returned to St. Louis, this time as the editor of a religious newspaper, the St. Louis Observer. At the Observer, Lovejoy did not shy away from controversial topics. He earned enemies by opposing Catholicism in St. Louis and rallied against the evils of alcohol and gambling. But most controversially, he opposed slavery. In 1835, he wrote, it becomes us as a Christian people, as those who believe in the future retribution of a righteous providence, to remove from our midst an institution, no less the cause of moral corruption to the master than to the slave. At the time, Lovejoy was not an abolitionist. He was a colonizationist. He supported a widely held belief that African slaves in America should be sent back to Africa. In fact, he opposed abolitionist newspapers and the abolitionist movement, which he thought is dangerous to society. But then came the terrible events surrounding the death of Francis McIntosh. A free black man, McIntosh had been arrested in St. Louis, April 28, 1836, for the crime of breach of the peace, purportedly for failing to assist an officer in capturing a fugitive. When one of the two officers holding McIntosh told him he would likely be sent to prison for five years for the crime, he stabbed the two men killing one and grievously injuring the other. He was caught and taken to jail, but shortly thereafter, a mob broke into the jail, dragged him to a tree, and burned him alive. The subsequent trial of members of the mob, ironically presided over by a judge named Luke Lawless, was a farce, with the judge essentially instructing the jury not to indict the men who'd participated in the lynching. In general, the St. Louis press tried to bury the story, afraid of inciting tensions in a city that, as a major port in a slave state surrounded by free states, was a center of both abolitionist and pro-slavery factions. But Lovejoy and the Observer railed against the mob action, calling it an act of awful and savage barbarity, and declared that it meant an end to the rule of law and order in St. Louis. A mob broke into the offices of the Observer and ransacked it, overturning the printing press. When his family was threatened with violence, Lovejoy decided to move the paper across the river to the city of Alton in Illinois, a free state, where he thought he would find more support. But despite the fact that Illinois was a free state, Alton had largely been founded and populated by pro-slavery Southerners. As it was on the border between Missouri and Illinois, escaped slaves would often come through Alton, which disturbed town residents who did not want to become a haven for escaped slaves, and Alton had become something of a center for slave catchers trying to recover escaped slaves. Moreover, at the time, Alton was a growing city that was looking to rival St. Louis, but that depended upon southern pro-slavery interests supporting them, as they were crucial to the river trade. Even as much as some of them opposed slavery, the leading men of the city could be said to be more interested in prosperity than in abolition. So Lovejoy's relocation was a matter of some consternation. 
A town meeting was called and Lovejoy was invited. He told the town leaders that he wasn't interested in publishing an abolitionist newspaper, he was there to publish a religious newspaper. But he made no guarantees that he wouldn't discuss abolitionist viewpoints, or any viewpoint for that matter. Accounts from the Times suggest that this did not placate his critics, who were afraid that his presence would hurt commerce. But he wasn't breaking any laws, and so they had no way to compel him to stop. An acquaintance described Lovejoy and how he was perceived in Alton at the time. I knew Mr. Lovejoy intimately. He was my next door neighbor. And in all the relations of life, so far as I could judge, he was the most exemplary. He was a man of considerable erudition and of charming conversational powers, and with the exception of a few ruffians, had not a personal enemy in the city. On the contrary, individually he was almost universally admired and esteemed. Lovejoy's views, however, were the subject of even greater concern among Altonians after the panic of 1837. The financial crisis was caused by a number of factors. Speculative lending, a land bubble, a drop in cotton prices, and more restrictive lending policies beginning all the way away in London. The panic of 1837 had wide-ranging economic effects, but it was most devastating to the South due to the collapse of the cotton market. This caused a corresponding decrease in Mississippi River trade, thus impacting Alton. Reduced trade sparked greater fears that Lovejoy's publication would drive away business. Meanwhile, Lovejoy's abolitionist views slowly became more ardent, especially after befriending theologian Edward Beecher, the brother of Harriet Beecher Stowe, who had authored Uncle Tom's Cabin. With Beecher's assistance, Lovejoy had become involved in an effort to establish a state anti-slavery society, and his editorial started attacking pro-slavery citizens of Alton, if not by name, but with enough detail that it was clear who he meant. On July 20th, 1837, he wrote in The Observer, Abolitionists, therefore, hold American slavery to be a wrong a legalized system of inconceivable justice, and a sin. In response, a mob broke into the Observer's office and destroyed the printing press. This actually engendered sympathy, and a fund was raised to replace the press. Observers noted that many who contributed opposed Lovejoy's views, but opposed mob violence more. His supporters at this point were more supporters of free speech than abolitionists, but the press was intercepted before it could be unloaded from a riverboat and thrown into the river. When it was clear that he intended to continue publishing, a group of leading citizens called another town meeting, taking Lovejoy to task for breaking what they claimed was a promise not to publish his abolitionist views. His defenders pointed out that he said that he had not intended to publish an abolitionist newspaper, but that he did not promise to not print abolitionist views. The town leaders were unswayed and voted for him to stop. He insisted that, despite most respectful feelings toward members of the committee, he did not recognize their authority to do so. He said, I believe that it is our duty and our high privilege to act and speak on all questions touching this great commonwealth. It was a laudable position and supported by the First Amendment to the United States Constitution, but it only further enraged his enemies that he ignored the decision of the town leadership. His supporters armed themselves and even drilled under the state's militia act and raised the money for yet another press. They managed to sneak the press into town by having it delivered upriver and then brought back on a southbound boat, as those weren't being washed by Lovejoy's detractors. They intended to prevent this press from being destroyed like the others. The press was moved to a warehouse owned by Godfrey Gilman and Company, fronting on Water Street. It was described as a large and strong stone building, three stories high in front and two stories high in the rear, in the middle of a block with a vacant lot on either side. The night of November 7th, a mob, numbering at least in the hundreds, although some accounts claim that most were simply bystanders, came to the warehouse, intent on destroying the press. Lovejoy and about 20 supporters, including William S. Gilman, who owned the building, locked themselves inside. The mayor of Alton, John Crom, came and tried to urge the mob to disperse. When he failed, he went to the warehouse and tried to convince the defenders to give up the press, as that was what the mob wanted. Lovejoy's people refused, indicating their willingness to defend the press with their lives. Crum left, but the defenders insisted he authorize them to use whatever force needed to defend themselves. The Alton Observer described the start of the encounter. Mr. Gilman appeared at an upper window. What do you want here? He asked the crowd. The press, came the shouted reply. Gilman responded, We have no ill feelings towards any of you and should much regret to do any injury, but we are authorized by the mayor to defend our property and shall do so with our lives. The mob tried to force their way in, but the building and doors were built very solidly. Finally, they resorted to throwing rocks, and then a shot was fired. The men in the warehouse responded with a volley of shots that killed a man named Bishop, 
whom some accounts claim was a violent member of the mob and who had promised to drive them out, and others claim was an innocent bystander and come to see what the fuss was about. In any case, both sides remained determined. By one account, the mob went to the nearby armory and acquired a cannon, only to find that they did not have the correct ammunition. Finally, the members of the mob decided to try to burn the building. A ladder was raised, and a boy with a torch was sent up to set fire to the roof, but Lovejoy and another volunteer had snuck out, and creeping in the shadows, had gotten close enough that when the ladder was raised, they were able to rush out and push it down before retreating back into the building. A second attempt was made, but as the two men came out again, this time shots rang out from behind a woodpile, and Lovejoy was shot. Some accounts say he was hit by multiple pistol shots, others say it was a shotgun blast. A person who purported to be a witness told the New York Times that he had encountered a noted young man of the city, noted both for his good and bad parts, with a gun in his hands. He said that Lovejoy was carrying a shotgun and that it misfired, and then the witness claims, the young man beside me raised his gun, and before I could prevent him, fired and sent an ounce ball directly through Mr. Lovejoy's heart. Lovejoy made it back into the building, saying, my God, I am shot. He crawled to the second floor before expiring. With Lovejoy dead, his supporters quickly fled the building, and the mob entered and destroyed the press, leaving Lovejoy's body where it lay. Tensions were so high in Alton that even Elijah Lovejoy's newspaper did not report on his death. His supporters were literally afraid for their very lives. No ceremony was held. He was buried secretly and privately in the Alton Cemetery two days later on November 9th, what would have been his 35th birthday. Members of both the mob that attacked the building and the defenders inside were charged with the crime of rioting, but none of them were convicted. But while his death and funeral were kept quiet in Alton, his death was heavily publicized in abolitionist newspapers throughout the country, and is credited with emboldening the abolitionist movement in the decades preceding the U.S. Civil War. Notably, John Brown, who advocated armed insurrection to overthrow slavery and was later hanged for treason for inciting a slave revolt in 1859, was heavily influenced by Lovejoy's murder publicly announcing after hearing the news, Here before God, in the presence of these witnesses, from this time, I consecrate my life to the destruction of slavery. In 1838, a member of the Illinois legislature mentioned both the deaths of Mackintosh and Lovejoy in a speech to the Young Men's Lyceum in Springfield, Illinois. The speech, which argued that slavery had resulted in mob action that threatened to undermine the Constitution, was published nationwide and raised to national status the previously little-known politician who would become the nation's 16th president. Elijah Lovejoy is often described as an abolitionist, and as such he is sometimes described as the first casualty of the U.S. Civil War, which started 23 years after his death. But not only does that characterization essentially ignore all those other factors that were driving the nation to war at the time, but it also fundamentally mischaracterizes Elijah Parrish Lovejoy, who much more properly is described as a publisher than as an abolitionist. As a publisher, Lovejoy took on controversial topics long before he became an abolitionist. In fact, he only became an abolitionist relatively late in his publishing career. And many of the people that were standing with him in that building defending his press weren't abolitionists at all. Rather, the cause for which he and they were fighting was the cause of a free press. As he tried to explain to the Alton town leaders who tried to silence him, he said, Gentlemen, as long as I am an American, as long as American blood runs through these veins, I shall hold myself at liberty to write, to speak, to publish on whatever I please, on any topic, being amenable to the laws of my country for the same. And thus, Elijah Parrish Lovejoy is considered by many historians to be the United States' first martyr in the cause of a free and independent press. In 1897, 60 years after his death, the people of Alton erected a 110-foot monument to Lovejoy in the Alton Cemetery. The inscription on the monument reads, This monument commemorates the valor, devotion, and sacrifice of the noble defenders of the press, who in this city on November 7, 1837, made the first armed resistance to the aggressions of the slave power in America. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.